want to ask the two actual unions sitting here. Um, and, uh, given obviously there has been representation of unions in the past year, but um, for NUMS and Solidarity, in a hypothetical situation where those additional costs, all those additional costs you refer to, were able to become more efficient so the costs would drop, would the unions be willing to negotiate on pay, not headcount? But is that, when, is that what needs to come to the table for the, for the negotiations to truly take a more constructive... Because um, I, I, I understand completely what you're saying. But to actually have a negotiation that is constructive in the end, is that what you would need to see? I think it would depend on what are we negotiating. Um, because, again, I feel we mustn't make the mistake of having a very narrow discussion. Is, this really, is the problem really the wages? Is it really the wages? And I think um, my colleague here has broken it down very clearly about uh, when you're looking at wages, he's talking about the top band, those who would be at executive level who are earning a million or more. Certainly not our members who are earning a million or more. And this is why for us it becomes a very problematic debate. Because you see, what you hear out there, especially dominating the media, is that we are the problem. But we're, we don't fit in that one million band mm -hmm. that has increased exponentially at a ridiculous rate. Our members are at the 11 rand per hour band where government has, has placed the national minimum wage. Uh, the very same band that the World Bank has critiqued and said, this is not the way to transform South Africa after having had more than 30 years of a repressive apartheid regime. So you've got the World Bank, even the right-wing World Bank, we consider the World Bank to be right-wing, <laughs> saying this, right? But the focus always shifts to the mm. poorest, to the working poor, as if squeezing more from the working poor is going to solve the problem. We've been very clear that if we're going to have a discussion about even salary reduction, let's go to where the problem is. And that's the only discussion that we're willing to have before we can even start to negotiate those who are at the lowest level. Because that's the only fair way, mm. let's be honest, to have that discussion. These are the people who are um, contributing the most. We're talking here about economic growth. This is the purpose of this discussion, isn't it? To find solutions for this economy that's not growing. Well, it's very obvious. There's very clear ways that are outlined even by this right-wing World Bank, where they talk about the fact that you need to have an economy where more people participate in the economy. The fastest way to achieve that, increase the wages. Why don't we have that happening in South Africa? Because unfortunately, as I said, until we deal with the racist nature of our economy, where people still think that black people should earn the lowest, until we deal with that, unfortunately, we're not going to get very far. Kirian, you want to add? Yes, you know, look, look, despite the fact that, you know, to have solidarity and, and NUMSA here, you have the two <laughs> opposites. Um, but in the end, we work well together because we represent then all the workers. But obviously, we strategize behind the scenes, but we have differences. So, so here we also have a difference in the specific debate because the the employees that we represent, the constituency that we represent, uh, falls into the middle class category. So our strategy for 2020 is, is very different. We said, first of all, and we've seen it over the past two years, where our members will come to us and say, you need to negotiate job security. Rather, cost of living increase, increase and then a moratorium and retrenchment. So we get that often. Mm -hmm. um, so the second thing is, uh, our strategy this year will be to look at portable skills at those workplaces, especially in the mining industry where um, our members face redu redundancy due to things, mines getting mined out, whatever. So you need to have a portable skills, you negotiate it. Secondly, reskilling, and that's the whole fourth industrial revolution uh, that we're already in for a, for a while now. And we know for our members, and if we look at our members alone, you know, in order for them to survive in this fourth industrial revolution, to have jobs, to have job security, all of that, it's reskilling is more important. Because our philosophy also is uh, 
given the fact that we've, our constituency is, is different. Our philosophy is, is if we negotiate very well, uh, our members can get a double digit increase, 10%. But if they increase their skills, they can triple their salaries. And that's the more the, the route that we are going. And we as a trade union invest also a lot, uh, regardless of the fact that it sometimes brings tension between ourselves and, and NUMSA, uh, in our own universities, and our own technical colleges, so that we can give that advantage to our members. So, um, so in the end, we believe that real empowerment lies in skills, especially scare skills. Right, you wanted to use one? Yeah, so just, I mean, so the, uh, the missing middle one, um, it holds true, just to answer Neil's uh, uh, comment, it holds true across time periods. It's slightly more exacerbated when you take the post-recession period. Uh, uh, it does, it wouldn't, uh, in terms of the occupations, maybe I didn't elaborate on that, those occupations tend to be the kinds of workers you'd expect in the informal sector, uh, mechanics, entry-level nurses, and so on. Um, the interesting thing is, just to feed, feed in again, there's a little bit for everybody. So the problem with the thinking about unions as uh, union wages are too high is that if you do the estimates in the aggregate for South Africa, proper regression analysis, this is important to do, right? Uh, the wage premium is only 7%. It's only 7%, which is similar to other middle-income countries. However, the public sector union wage premium is about 20%. That's inordinately high. And, and, and so effectively what you've got uh, is a, a labor elite that exists in the unionized public sector worker space based on the regression results, right? Um, but does that suggest that that's where, and I think sort of beating the dead horse of the wage bill doesn't seem like an avenue worth pursuing ad nauseum, right? There's spaces where you can save, and I think certainly massive cuts in terms of uh, procurement prices that are way too high. But the other thing that's important is supply side initiatives targeting, incentive, targeting incentives to firms to hire workers. So the most successful one that took us 20 years to get going was the employment tax incentive, right? And that's now been extended by 10 years and that's been a, I mean that's, all the evidence shows that it's been a huge success, right? Um, all the careful econometric evidence, not the descriptive sort of choose what you want kind of evidence. And for me, incentivizing employment creation for firms is rather the way to think about employment growth, right? Together, I must add though, I think management of what's happening to the middle of the distribution is really important. The pressure those households are facing on the price side, administered prices, energy, water, uh, education, clothing, uh, health prices, the urban working class, if you like, is under huge pressure, mm. right? And the minimum wage is coming to support those at the bottom end. That's really what's happening. And the top end are taken care of because everybody's really scared that you're going to leave, right? Because uh, you're highly mobile. But it's the middle that have borne the brunt of squaring this wage bill. And I think that's a really important uh, um, factor to manage uh, going forward.